if your state does not require you to, to carry renter's insurance, can the landlord force it? And the answer is yes. Nothing will crush a real estate investor's spirit like landlord stress. The difference between being successful and miserable in managing properties is education. Welcome to Landlord University, where landlords learn. Landlord University is recorded from inside the rent prep office where Stephen White and Jeff Pearson share the lessons learned from working with some of the most successful landlords. Welcome to Landlord University in the News. I'm Jeff Pearson. I'm here with my co-host, Stephen White. Hello, Stephen. How are you doing today? Doing great, Jeff. Excited to be here for another episode of In the News. And uh, I know that you had some information to, uh, t to for the listeners today. Yes. I want to be sure that everybody knows if they have any thoughts or ideas about articles or items in the news pertaining to landlords or rental properties, that we'd love to hear about it. And if they get a chance, they can email us at landlordu at rentprep.com. So I just wanted to throw that in there before we get started. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, ever since we've been mentioning that, we've definitely gotten a lot of uh, listener submissions and uh, people writing in. Sometimes it's just to ask a really basic question. Sometimes it's to offer a topic that they want us to cover, which we have in the past. So feel free to reach out and uh, we respond to them all. So, you know, uh, you're going to get a response uh, quickly. Yes. And we love talking about those. And we, as you said, we've, we've talked about some of them in our night school episodes. All right. Well, uh, and uh, as always for In the News, we've got Jennifer here with us today who brought us a couple of uh, handpicked articles relating to landlords. So without any further ado, Jennifer, what'd you find? Hi, everyone. Today, I've brought you guys the results of a survey. It was conducted for insurancequotes.com, and it has to do with the topic of renters insurance and millennials. Now, we've talked before in the past, there's no doubt that millennials are the highest demographic for renters in this country. But this uh, survey shows that as many as 57% don't carry renter's insurance. And the surveyors discovered that the biggest reasons that millennials don't carry renter's insurance is that they have a real lack of knowledge about it. So here's some of the numbers from the survey. 32% of millennial renters say they don't have it because they're unsure how it works. 52% of millennial renters thought that landlord insurance will cover their possessions if anything should happen, like a burglary or a fire. 29% of them think that renter's insurance is just simply unaffordable. And when asked to guess how much they thought renter's insurance was per year, uh, a huge number of them guessed that it was around $1,000 per year, when in fact, most of the really basic policies are under $200 a year. So I thought this would be really interesting to talk about because we know it, it's in uh, every landlord's best interest to have renters carrying their own policies. So I wanted to talk about some ways that maybe landlords could start to affect some change with these numbers and with these millennial renters. Yeah, and I, you know, it's interesting as I know from the landlord's perspective, there's a lot of misconceptions from landlords too. Uh, we did an article, uh, a blog article on rent prep maybe a year ago, and we got a lot of good feedback on it. Um, and I think the, rent pr the article specifically was discussing if your state does not require you to, to carry renter's insurance, can the landlord force it? And uh, the answer is yes. You know, you can, as a landlord, in your lease, you can uh, put in there that you're requiring them to carry renter's insurance, even if, you know, state law doesn't require them to do so. So always a good idea to carry it in there. Um I've got a good friend who who owns an insurance company and talks about this very often. And there's so many things that uh, a renter is covered for with that insurance coverage, and it's a no-brainer. And yeah, it's cheap. I mean, it's dirt cheap. So, you know, I remember bet way back when I was a renter. Um, you know, we had it. I think it was maybe twenty, twenty-five dollars a month, something like that. But it was very, very inexpensive. So, yeah, thousand dollars a year, not not even close. It's interesting, you know, looking at this survey, you see a number of different things. You know, one of the big things is that they found that 60% of the 18 to 29-year-olds are renters compared to 36% of Americans overall. So obviously, you have these young people who have little to no experience in the world of property insurance or, or uh, renter's insurance. And, you know, finding ways of educating them is important. And I don't know, besides landlords requiring them to have renter's insurance, there need to be some other ways to, to teach these people what the insurance is about. And the, like Jennifer said, it's not that expensive. Well, you know what I've seen work really well is um, for landlords to establish a relationship 
with uh, an insurance agent or broker that carries the renter's insurance. And, you know, they're they're giving them information to be able to pass on to the renter and say, hey, you know, even if you're not requiring it, give it to them. Say, hey, here, something to consider, look into. I've got a relationship with this person. Maybe, you know, he might, he covers all my other tenants or maybe he'll get you in, give you like a discount or a group rate or something. Um, but, you know, it's not a bad idea for the landlord to either – impose that it's that it's mandated or at least pass on the information because i think you know this article clearly proves that people are just unaware of either the benefits the cost um you know and 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 probably how to even get it yes and you know when you think of the landlords who rent in in university towns college towns that's a great opportunity to really provide a little bit of education to these renters, as you said, even if they're not requiring that they have that insurance, if they at least have some type of, of information that they provide to them to let them know how inexpensive it is and what, when I as a landlord have a property that I'm renting out, what does my insurance cover and what does it not cover? Pass that along to your tenant so that they understand if something happens, they're not going to be covered you know, my, my insurance is covering my building. It's not covering your stuff. Right. And you know, one thing that always shocked me that, and I can remember reading it from, from my buddy who has the insurance agency, um, who is like a perfect example that, you know, a renter's car gets broken into. It doesn't even have to be on the property. Their vehicle insurance doesn't cover that. That's renter's insurance that would cover the loss from anything stolen from the vehicle. Right. So, you know, that's a perfect example there of a bigger benefit than just inside the unit, inside the apartment. You know, that insurance coverage covers a lot of things, and it's just good to have anyway. It is. And again, it's important for these young people to understand what renter insurance is all about. And the more that we as landlords can do to pass that along, the better it will be for everybody. Yeah. Now, Jennifer, I'm curious, in Utah, when you were managing properties, was that something that you guys required or um, at least tried to to promote or was it not an issue? Uh, When I was a property manager, it was not required for us to have – we did not require as a company require them to have renter's insurance. But I do believe that, as I've mentioned in the past, we had a lot of housing voucher Rent, uh, tenants, and I believe that that is part of that system is that they need mm-hmm. to have either it's provided by them or they have to get it independently. I can't exactly remember, but I, I do know that there is some sort of renter's insurance built into that particular program. So, yes, I know, and I don't know in Utah, but I know in New York State it's built into the program. So, right. I know that uh, in those cases there would be some coverage there. Um, so, yeah, that's a good thing, you know, that some people may automatically be covered um, if they're, you know, on a voucher program, or Section 8 or whatever. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, definitely, even as a landlord, good to look into, you know, if you're accepting Section 8, trust me, you're going to be in close contact uh, with the department and making sure that, you know, the inspections and everything else. So, it's worth asking, you know, what, uh, what insurance, if any, uh, they provide to the renters. I do want to point out to the listeners um, to go check out the Rent Prep blog. This news article actually inspired me to write an article that posted last week about um, informing potential tenants, applicants about the benefits of renter's insurance. And there's a whole section in there about how landlords can help educate. Um, One of the ideas that I came across was a lot of landlords have kind of welcome packets or information packets during like a, an open house or, mm-hmm. you know, when talking to applicants and to include just go get a brochure or a little pamphlet or something from a local agency, um, frequently asked questions list a lot. I mean, they want to sell their insurance, so they're going to have all kinds mm-hmm. of literature that you can pass along. And just being the first, one of the first people that a, that a young millennial applicant might encounter and even would ask some questions about. That's just a great frontline approach. But there's some other ideas in that article. So I just point point folks to that uh, yeah, blog and, to our blog and, and to check that out and get some more ideas. Yeah. And great point on the, uh, the welcome package. That's something I was going to mention too. It's something that Jeff and I've talked many times about on the, on night school. Uh, that's perfect to include into that, you know, if you, like you said, just handing out information, slip that in there. And I don't know, you know, an insurance agency in the world that's going to tell you they don't, they're not going to hand you a handful of brochures if you're willing to, you know, to promote them and, and get their information out as well. So that's a, that's a great way to do it. It really is. Well, Jennifer, tell us a little bit about our next article. 
Well, sure. Uh, this is an article from Michigan, and of course the legislative season is either finished or winding up, so there's lots of proposed bills that, that were kind of making their way through, but this one was kind of interesting. Uh, it's, this proposed bill would allow landlords to send eviction notices to tenants via email, and that would be in place of a hand-delivered notice or by traditional mail, which mm -hmm. all states have to do. This bill does clarify that the tenants would have to agree up front about this electronic notice process, and landlords couldn't refuse to lease to an applicant who did not want to opt into the electronic notice. Uh, there is a bit of controversy on this from both sides, and I can really see some pros and cons. So I wanted you guys to weigh in on this possible high-tech evolution of mm -hmm. eviction notices. I'm for it. I, you know, having some some experience and background in the collection uh, industry, I know that it's something that was kicked around a lot there. Um, you know, the ideas of, of, uh, of, you know, serving notices, sending notices via email, you know, I think you have to really look at the times that we're in. Most people have emails. Um, I would say, you know, by far the majority of people have an email account and, uh, it, it makes sense. I mean, especially if the person's agreeing to it ahead of time, you know, that's something that is easily included into a, you know, as a lease addendum or something that somebody can sign off on. And I think it, it, it reduces the chances that people are going to waste time, you know, uh, paying a process server to have to try and show up and figure out when the person's going to be there, you know, dealing with them, not answering the door, you know, or, an or answering the door or anything like that. So this to me is, is, I feel like it's a great idea. I think so too. You know, having gone through the eviction process and and doing the the process server and the first class mail and all of those things, to be able to just send an email is a wonderful thing. I like the fact that that tenants can opt out. So if they don't want that for whatever reason, they can opt out. But hopefully, most tenants will allow that. And I think depending on the way you you create your agreement or draft your agreement, you should be able to make it so that the majority of your tenants agree to do it and they don't even think twice about it. Makes sense. I mean, I could think of almost anything that I deal with now, banking, you know, uh, utilities, bills, anything. You always have that option. Go paperless, get the electronic version. And I, you know, sometimes it becomes overwhelming in your inbox when you start getting all kinds of stuff. But Again, you know, if they're agreeing to it, and I really do feel like it makes sense, and of course, it's going to alleviate some pressure on the landlord and, and cost, you know, from having to, like you mentioned, the certified registered mail, taking all that route, process servers you're paying for, um, this is the fastest way to, to get them a notice. So it makes sense. Well, I have one question then. Um, how do you prove that the tenant received it? You can prove that you sent it. But if the tenant in, uh, in court, how do you prove that I was received? I mean, we're the technology is fantastic, but there, of course, are instances where emails don't ever arrive, or the tenant could just delete it and trash it and say, "Oh, I never got it. You didn't serve me properly." Part of the mm -hmm. eviction process is having these very specific steps for mm -hmm. this is received this day, this was here. Make a copy. If you're hand delivering it, you know you have them sign a acceptance or whatever. And traditional mail, you send it certified so that you have proof that it was delivered. So my only concern on this one would be. If it came right down to it, you could prove that you sent it, but how do you prove that the tenant received it? That's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> there are actually programs that allow you to track whether emails have been received and read. Uh, oh, good. Well, certainly in in some programs like Outlook, you can ask for a, a receipt, a send receipt or a received receipt. But in Gmail, there are some add-ons, and we can talk about this in a night school episode. I'd have to go back and look at the names, but there are some programs that allow you to see when people have read an email. Well, that would be the ideal solution. That's yeah, cool. yeah. I'm, I now I use Outlook and Gmail, but in my Outlook, it comes up as one of those things where you know, uh, read receipt, choose yes or no, so I could see where Jennifer's coming from. You could easily click no and say, no, you know, if I get something like a blind sales e email and somebody attaches a read receipt to it, sometimes I'll click no on that or something. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to learn more about the Gmail apps uh, or plugins that they might have. But yeah, that's that's a downside that I didn't really think of until you mentioned it, Jennifer. But yeah, that's 
that's something that they'd have to address for sure. And then, then you'd have to get everybody using a system like that. Otherwise, you have the potential of having it thrown out for improper service. Good point. Uh, and, they, and they don't address that in here either, which is Mm-mm. kind of surprising. It'd inter- yeah, it'd be interesting to follow up. Yeah, and there's a possibility that they talk about it in the details of the bill. Um, we just have this this one article that, that just covers the, the major points of the topic. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see if they do cover that because I, I think that's a potential problem. I've seen a lot of things, judgments, uh, that's something that we deal with pretty often here. You know, you see a judgment that has to be vacated because of improper service. So, you know, that's a big part of the legal process. And if they don't have that figured out or ironed out, then, yeah, they're not really achieving much doing this. Nope, not at all. Definitely the wave of the future. I think I think it's just a matter of ironing out those details. But I think yeah. using technology to better further landlording, um, I think mm-hmm. is, is definitely a wave of the future. I think Michigan's taking a look at that, and hopefully they're working out all those details that would be loopholes that would cause problems. Right. I'm, I'm waiting for the day that you know, because I remember a couple of years ago, I remember hearing that the post office was concerned that email was going to severely affect their business, and I think. Even a couple of years ago, they talked about taking Saturdays out. Now they're adding Sundays because just the the way that things are shifting, you know, people are or you know shopping online, and so the post office kind of has this, you know, has been reborn into shipping stuff that people are ordering online. But they're definitely not sending as much mail and bills and things like that. So things are definitely changing, and I think now's the time that we're going to start seeing bills like this being proposed and you know, big changes being made that, you know, in the future, we will have seen when that shift was sort of made. So it'll be interesting to follow and see how this goes, because as we know, there's usually, you know, passes somewhere and then other states start to jump on it. So I could see this being a popular thing if they, if they iron it out. Yes, I agree. Steve and Jennifer, thank you very much. Look forward to talking to you next week when Jennifer brings us some more great articles. Thanks. Yep. Thanks guys. Thanks for listening to Landlord University. And remember to visit rentprep.com slash landlordu to see show notes and access free resources like forms and guides. And be sure to check out Jeff Pearson hosting his own hit podcast at thementorimpact.com.